sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when 
Good morning. Some of us are looking a little more tired than others. You know where our rummage sale workers are here. I heard it was an amazing turnout. A huge, uh, huge number of people, a lot of donations, and it turns out I think we raised over $3,000. We don't know what the final count is, but it's a good amount. So thank you. I know you guys, everybody contributed something. You're praying, uh, donating things, or coming there to either spend money or help other people spend money so thank you very much uh, for being part of that it's just it's a big effort and a special thanks to Mary Owen and all the other helpers that spent weeks preparing the rummage sale so we very very much appreciate that it's a it's kind of a bittersweet day for us here at Knox um, a year and a half ago, Sarah came up to me and handed me a resignation letter. Uh, she she kind of threw it at me in my face, really. <laughs> said, I'm out of here. No, she, she, she has, she's been going to grad school. She's working. She said it just became a little too much. And we, we said, well, we're very sorry to see you go. And then COVID happened. And she just kind of stuck around anyways. And she ha spent the last year really helping us, uh, contributing to a regular week weekly music ministry here at Knox. It was beyond what we expected. We didn't ask. She just kind of kept coming, kept helping. And so a few weeks ago, she threw another letter in my face and said, well, now that things are calming down, she's got grad school. She's got other responsibilities. So this is her very last Sunday helping us here with the music ministry. So I just want to say thank you so much, Sarah. You've just been such a wonderful wonderful contribution to the church so um, and Gordon's going to be sticking around and helping taking over uh, leading our music in the coming weeks so please pray for him and give him your support um, we also want to say a special thank you to Jan and Steve for running the service last week. Uh, we were, I was on vacation with my family. It was just great to know that the church was in good hands. I watched the service. I thought it went very well, and I uh, just want to thank them for that. Uh, if you did not get a communion cup, we are going to have communion today. Please raise your hand, and our usher will come up if we have an usher. Do we have an usher today? All right, our ushers, our, usher, our substitute usher here is going to come up. Just keep your hands up uh, when she comes, and we'll make sure you get a communion cup. And finally, our last announcement is that this Wednesday, we're going to start a new teaching series for the month of June and kind of dribbling over there into July. It's a five-week series called Exploring Islam. My wife saw that and she said, why are you teaching about Islam? I said, that's a great question. It's because this whole series is about educating Christians on what Islam believes on what, how Muslims live, in order that we may be able to love our neighbors and witness to them more effectively. Uh, because I think a lot of us might know somebody who is a Muslim, but if we don't really understand where they're coming from, uh, we can't really talk with them, have that good conversation with them. And also, it helps us understand as Christians why what we believe is a lot different than what Islam teaches and believes. Because I, I, I remember several years ago, I had a doctor... And he, he and I were just talking, and he said, well, I want to I just tell everybody in the world that basically Jews and Islam and Christians all believe the same thing. I think we could all get together on the same page. And I said, that's just not possible. It's not possible because at the core of everything we believe as Christians is Jesus Christ. And what Islam believes about Jesus is light years away from what we do. And so I think it's very important for us to study this um, because it is a video series series, we are not able to offer it online through Zoom. If you are not able to attend on Wednesday nights, but you're still interested in the class, the best I can do is I can get you the notes. I could even sit down and talk you through it. So that starts this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Come at 6.30 for our prayer service. It's a really good time to have a prayer meeting. Our group's actually been thriving on Wednesday nights, so make it a point. Come and pray with us at least once a month. That's all our announcements today. Let's stand and call to worship. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. We will give thanks to you, O oh Lord, with our whole heart. We will tell your word. We have sing praises 
praise to your name, oh how high. Now time for Sarah. Good morning, thank you for joining us this morning. So our first song today will be Reckless Love. thy faithfulness.
We're just saying about God's reckless love, His reckless love for us. And when we look at the word reckless, it means acting without fear of the consequences. That for God, rescuing us was far more important to Him than worrying about the consequences of having to pay the price for our sins. That is his reckless love for you. You woke up this morning, if you are in Christ, you woke up a son or daughter of the king. You woke up with the promise of redemption, the promise of riches beyond imagination for all eternity. That is a good way to start a day. Let's continue our day with prayer to our Most High. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I think one of the greatest mysteries, the mysteries that the Bible says even the angels long to look into, is the mystery of why you love us so very much. Why you love us, not just to make us, not just to provide a world for us, but Lord, to redeem us when we fell away from you. When we rebelled, and we hated you, and we cursed your name, and we killed your son. And Lord, even then, you loved us so much. You loved us. And Lord, I, I look forward to the day when you get to explain to me and you get to explain to all of us face to face why it is that you find us so precious. Because I know it's not anything about what I've done, about our accomplishments, about our inherent self-worth. Lord, we have no worth unless it's in you. But in you, our self-worth becomes immeasurable. And so, Lord, we praise your name. We praise your name knowing that we are victorious in you. And I pray for us, because, Lord, sins linger still, that we still have in us the temptation to fall back, temptation to go out into the world and fight as they do, fight with words and anger, arguing with people who see things differently than us. And Lord, you have called us to a different life. You've called us to your high standards, but also to, to live a life of grace, of humility, of love. You've called us to live in peace as much as is possible. 
And I pray that, Lord, we would take those words to heart. That we would look to Jesus Christ and the life he lived. Lord, that he wasn't combative. He didn't get in people's faces. But, Lord, he just simply proclaimed the truth. He lived the truth. And he loved other people in actions as well as words. Lord, I pray that that would be our life as well. I lift up to you several people, Lord, who are in great need of your care and assistance this week. For Cindy and Sue, we're glad to have them back here today. And we know that, Lord, they've gone through a bit of a process and they need your continued healing hand. But especially also for Pearl and for Carol and for Pat. Lord, all of them had had surgeries recently and they're all doing well, but there's some pain lingering. There's some physical therapy in their future. And we just pray that you give them the strength and the encouragement they need to get through this and to get home. Lord, also we want to thank you for a wonderful rummage sale. Uh, Lord, we didn't do it just to fill our coffers, but we, we, want to, we wanted to do it to, uh, to, to use this money wisely. And we just thank you for everybody you brought into these doors. I pray that several people who experienced uh, the face of, Mount, or face of Knox here, that they might come back. They might see a church that lo lives to serve and that wants to have personal relationships. And I pray that that would just be a wonderful way to kind of open our doors here. And Lord, as we look forward to the future, I pray that you would empower each one of us here at Knox to fulfill the vision of this church, to model the mission of Christ by growing and serving and loving. And for each of us, that's different, Lord. You've called us each to different ministries. You've given us each different gifts. I just pray that we would realize those gifts, realize the ministries to which you have called us, and that we as a church may step up to serve you and to serve the world, that we might be your light, to be an ambassador for your name. And all these things and so much more, Lord, we glorify your name. You are great above all the earth. And at your name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord now and always. Amen. If you got a Bible with you, open up to Jonah 2. And please rise as we read our scripture today. Jonah 2, 6 through 9. Please read along with me as we read the word of the Lord written from God to you. But you, Lord, my God, you brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away <clears throat> from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. This is the word of God for your edification, your hearing. May you receive it as such. Please have a seat. So say you lived in the ancient world, and you got into a bit of trouble. You committed a crime, or you were accused of committing a crime. I know we have very law-abiding citizens here at Knox, but just for a minute, imagine you did. You were accused of a crime. What was the justice system like back then? It was a lot different. You were not going to get put in front of a jury of your peers to hear all the evidence. There were a lot of different ways that the ancient world would conduct their justice system, but a very common way was called a trial by ordeal. A trial by ordeal. I know some of you are saying, well, I've been married. I've gone through that trial. <laughs> Not that trial by ordeal. Trial by ordeal uh, would be going through some sort of physical process to determine whether or not you were guilty or innocent. Probably the most common of them was called trial by water. And trial by water was pretty simple. Say Dot got up to no good. And they would take Dot out. they say, well, 
We don't know if you're innocent or guilty, so we're going to leave it up to the gods. <laughs> Dot crossed this river. And Dot would wade in there, smiling, until her head, you know, went under the water. And so the idea was for you to go out into the middle of the river, and if you could cross the river and get to the other side, you were innocent. The gods had smiled upon you. Wonderful things had happened. But if, the, if you were guilty, or you were a murderer, who is a very good swimmer, um, but, you know, things got over your head, you would be swept downstream, and you would be drowned, and the gods had pronounced their judgment. That was trial by water. They let the river decide your guilt. Well, Israel certainly did not do trials by water. Places like Assyria did that. That's something you would encounter if you lived in Nineveh. But in Israel, they had their own justice system uh, because they had a much greater authority, of course. They had God, and God would give wisdom to his priests and to his leaders. But in Jonah chapter 2, as we're reading through this psalm of Jonah, the second part of this psalm that we started a couple weeks ago, we kind of see that Jonah has been going through his own trial by water, his trial by sea, really, that he's been thrown in. He's been guilty and thrown in to sink or swim. And what, of course, happens? He sinks. Last time we talked about how he went all the way down. He was down. His feet were touching the bottom. His breath was bubbling out. He was drowning very, in a very real way. And through this ordeal, Jonah knows he's guilty. There's not one verse here, not one word, where Jonah is protesting his innocence. I love my kids, but anytime they get into trouble, they're so very quick to point a finger. Well, well, they were doing it too, right? You know, like they acknowledge their guilt, but in the same breath, they were pointing fingers. They were trying to get an excuse going. Jonah's not doing that. He's at no point is he doing that here. But as he's seeking to death, what is he doing? He pleads for mercy and deliverance and salvation. He knows that the only thing that could help him keep his footing as he's going through this trial by water, the only thing that could possibly help him keep his head above water is God. And fortunately, God does save him. As it says in Isaiah 43, and hear this in terms of a trial by river, where God says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. It's God's wonderful comfort when we're in the middle of that river, whatever your river may be, and sometimes those rivers hit us and they hit us hard and we feel like they're sweeping right over our heads, God is calling out saying, I fear not. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. There's that call, the, the call of the elect right there. You see, if it was just up to Jonah alone, his sin would condemn him. His sin would send him down to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, never to be seen again. And if it was up to us alone, our sin would certainly condemn us. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. We are offered mercy and grace, not because God's a really nice God and figured he's going to throw us a freebie, but we're offered that mercy and grace because instead of us going through the trial by river, Jesus Christ did it for us. He went through his own baptism, his own trial. Where Jonah, where our ability to save ourselves ended, God's salvation begins. And that's really what the second part of this psalm is all about. The source of salvation. I want us to look at the source of our salvation. And because time and again, the Bible tells us that the source of salvation doesn't come from deep within ourselves. I don't care if you're a very strong-willed person, if you have physical stamina, if you are following your dreams and following your heart to wherever it may lead you, it will never be enough to save yourself. The world tells you, well, just follow your heart and you will be fulfilled. The Bible says you follow your heart, you will fall into sin again and again and again because you are a sinful creature. And that's where your heart's going to lead you every time. But stirring his stay at Hotel Big Fish, 
Jonah realizes that the source of salvation is God and God alone. He says this starting in verse 6. He says, But you, Lord my God, you brought my life up from the pit, from hell. Jonah didn't praise his own skills here. He's not saying, well, God, you did a pretty good job. But, I mean, my, my water-treading skills did the other 5% here. He wasn't really praising his own inherent righteousness. He wasn't saying, well, that fish came to me because I could speak whale. I had a great whale call, and, you know, so he came on by. Jonah fully acknowledges there was nothing he could do to save himself. It was drummed in his head as he's drowning. There's nothing unless God threw him a life preserver. And he was given this grace and mercy when God scooped him up. But look at everything that had to happen before Jonah finally gets to verse 6 here. And he finally gets to the moment where he calls out for mercy and he calls out for deliverance. He's fleeing God trying to control his destiny, trying to save himself, and he doesn't call out to God until he's been battered by the storm, when the, he's, until the, the lots have been cast to put, single him out and saying, this is the one who's been guilty. He doesn't call out until he's been thrown overboard. He doesn't call out until he's been sinking down to the bottom. He doesn't call out until it's his very last breath in this world. And he finally gets to the point where he calls out for salvation, for the mercy he did not deserve. It puts into my mind the difficulty that ranchers have in taming horses. We were out in the countryside this past week. We saw a lot of horses. At one point, we're driving along. And my wife says, stop the car! I thought something was wrong. I, I hit the brake really hard. We stopped the car. She jumped out because there was a herd of horses and a tiny baby foal. And that foal was standing there with like the legs all, you know, like the cute little wobbly. And she had to, of course, get a million pictures of those horses. But those were tame horses. And my kids were asking several weeks ago, how do we get horses? How do, they, how do they tame horses? How do they take a wild horse and tame it? I said, well, it's a, it's a big process. It's called breaking, breaking a horse. Because you see, a horse is stubborn. A horse has a will of its own. It wants to do its own thing. It wants to go to its own place. So if you grab a horse, you have to make sure it knows you are the boss. And the only way to do that is to break that horse's will. And it takes a long time. Some horses, it depends on how stubborn they are, it could take you maybe, if you're really good, a few days, weeks, maybe even months. But you gotta stop that horse from biting you, from trying to kick at you, from trying to run away. You have to be patient with it. You have to lead it through a routine. You have to saddle it up, and you gotta eventually ride it. And only then is a horse's will broken to the point where it will follow your commands, where it will go to where you are guiding it. Brothers and sisters, we are far more stubborn than the wildest stallion in the world. That is our nature as sinners. We are stubborn. We are entrenched. We want to do our own thing. And God says, if I am to redeem you, I got to break you. I got to break you of your stubbornness and your sin. And that's what he's doing to Jonah. This entire chapter is he's breaking Jonah finally to the point where Jonah is turning around to God, asking for deliverance and repentance. And for us, he does the same thing. When we flee from God and we're kicking against his commands and we're biting at his touch, he has to bring us to a point where we are broken. And how long that takes is different. How God does that for each one of us is different. But you never become a Christian until you get to the point where God has broken you of your dependence on sin. And he has broken you to the point where you realize how much you need to be delivered. And for some of us, it is painful, it is humbling, it is hard, but none of us ever regret that God has taken that time to bring us to that point of breaking us. Because the end result of Psalm 51, when David was broken in his sin, remember when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and he wrote, and God called him on that, and he, God broke David in that moment, and he wrote Psalm 51, a psalm of repentance, and in that psalm 
David says, God, you love a broken and contrite heart. What's the opposite of that? A stubborn heart. A stubborn heart that lives for itself in sin. He says, no, God, you love a broken heart. Maybe you feel like you're kicking against God today. Maybe you've been kicking against God your whole life. That you feel like you don't need salvation. You don't need to be broken of these comfortable, sinful habits that you've been in, uh, in the routine of doing for so long. Just know this. God's not going to give up on you. He loves you. He's coming after you. And that coming after is not something to be feared. It's something to be embraced. Even as the process of being broken can be painful and humbling. Because you need his hand. His guiding tender hand. His patient care. God's more stubborn than you are. It's just uh, you're never going to win that, that fight. I recently watched a really excellent miniseries on HBO called Chernobyl. Has anybody seen the Chernobyl miniseries? You've seen it. It's incredible. You got it. I mean, I, I called my mom. I said, you got to see this. I don't normally tell people to watch something from HBO. But this was a really great miniseries about the Chernobyl meltdown. I had really known very little about it. I knew like two or three like, little facts. But really, this whole miniseries gives you the full sense of what happened. So you're watching this horrific nuclear accident and you're seeing just all the, all the fallout, the literal fallout of it. But what I was really intrigued is over the course of these five hours of the miniseries is that they really kind of drilled into your head how this terrible accident was compounded by the denial of people, by people in a government refusing to ask for help when they really needed it, of a stubborn and proud people. So when the explosion of the nuclear reactor happened, the people who were in charge hesitated to even acknowledge that it did blow up. They, they frittered around for hours instead of saying, yeah, well, this is a very serious situation. And then when it came to the communist government, the government didn't want to admit to the world because they'd lose face that one of their famed nuclear reactors had now melted down. And as a result, so many people died that might have lived otherwise. It's all about control. It's all about control. And here in Jonah, we see this theme of control has been going back and forth like a tug of war throughout the entire first and second chapter. That Jonah, he's pulling hard because he wants to control his own life. He wants to flee away from God. He wants to tell God, no, I will not do this mission that you've assigned me. I'm going to get on this ship. I'm going to go as far away as I possibly can. I want control of my life. That is a sinner, sinful heart talking, always. When somebody says, I want control. And God is trying to exercise his control by using nature to call Jonah back to him, by using the storm and the fish to pull Jonah back. Throughout this entire first chapter, Jonah assumed he could control the situation. He could control his destiny. And so when the storm tossed that ship around, Jonah, as we talked about in previous weeks, he was stubborn and he refused to ask for help. And again, I ask us, what would have happened if on the deck of that boat, Jonah knelt down and he repented to God? I think he would have saved himself a whole lot of personal distress, not to mention a lot of water damage to his clothes. If he had just repented at that moment, if he didn't have to hold out stubbornly and pridefully until God finally broke him. But what's important to note here is that this defiant sinner did not come around until God acted to change his heart. He needed a divine intervention. We need divine intervention in our lives. And as verse 7 says, Jonah finally got around to a point where he could plead for mercy where he could get past his sinful heart. And in verse 7, he said, My prayer then rose to you, to your holy temple. Remember the temple back then, that was where God was. So the focal point of everybody's worship in Israel was on the temple. And so his prayers are going to God, to his ears. But the glorious message of the gospel, I mean, of course, God could have said, Well, Jonah, pfft. Dude, you stood me up, man. I'm not, I'm not going to save you right now. God could have said that, but the glorious message of the gospel is completely opposite. God says, anyone, anyone who calls upon me will be saved. 
I don't care what you've done in the past. I don't care what you've said in the past. I don't care how mean you were to me. It's not about revenge. It's about the gospel. You can be any nationality, any ethnicity, either gender, any age, any income level, any skill set, any family situation. And if you call out for God, he is faithful and says, I got you. And I'm never going to let you go. I got you. He will grant you the grace of salvation and forgiveness. So at this moment, Jonah calls out. His prayer lifts up to God, and God's response descends upon him. And that's how it is. That salvation is guaranteed to anyone who calls out. And this is the message that we who are saved must continually take to our family and friends. Because I am sick and tired of hearing people say, I'm not good enough for God. I've lived so long and I've committed so many horrible things that God would not want me. That they know in their heart of hearts how many times they've cursed God, how many times they've ignored Him, and they haven't forgiven themselves. So they figure there's no way God could forgive them. We need to carry them this message saying, look at Jonah. If God could forgive Jonah... God can forgive you. Because Jonah knew better than you did. Jonah knew the God he served. He knew him so well. And he ran away. And God still, when Jonah called up for repentance, God delivered him. Salvation is for all who call. Well, if you've ever been on a really, really long road trip on the highway you'll know that there's just nothing to look at. There's, there's other cars, there's a road, there's some trees, and if you're really lucky, there's a barn every now and then. But highways are among the most boring things to look at in this world. So that's why they put the billboards, right? So the billboard comes up. Normally, you'd be like, I don't, wanna, I don't care about ads. I skip over them in magazines. I skip over them on TV. You're driving, and that ad is now the most fascinating thing you've ever seen in your life, right? And it's particularly the ads that promise you some entertaining diversion at two exits ahead. And so you're driving along and you're so bored and suddenly you see a sign saying Indiana's biggest grain silo museum and your brain's like yes, yes, let's go. Two exits ahead, family, let's go. And before you know it, you've bought tickets and you're walking around this museum. Why, why am I here? I don't know. But that's how diversions work is they get you off the highway. They want, it, they want to get you off. That's okay when you're taking a road trip. Not for dads. Dads, we want to get, we want to get to where we want to get. No diversions. But the family works on us. But likewise, in our life, there is no end to the diversions, to the billboards that pop up trying to get you off the path to God. That we're on that path and we wake up in the morning, we're like, dear Lord, we love you. I want to follow your commands today. I don't want to sin as much today. I'm happy that you saved me today. And by nine o'clock, there's something that's popped up and suddenly you're driving right off the road because an idol, a diversion has come up that says, listen, God's good and all, but we're better. Pay attention to us. Anytime, remember, anytime you elevate something above the worship and love of Jesus Christ, that thing has become an idol. And that thing could be a family member. That thing could be a passion, a hobby, anything that goes above Jesus suddenly becomes an idol and distracts you off your roads. And the thing about the idols of this world is that they are flashy, they are appealing, they are everywhere, but they cannot satisfy you in the long run. They are very short-term, temporary diversions. They cannot make good on their own claims to salvation. And that's what the inherent promise of any idol really is. That if you invest your attention and your time into whatever that is, it will satisfy you. It will save you. It will make you feel fulfilled and purposeful and happy. And that is the salvation that they're proclaiming. Every fast food commercial I've ever seen proclaims their salvation from your hunger. Just eat that McDLT and you will be saved until an hour later when you regret your decision and you are no longer you know, full. You're no longer sat satiated. And that's what idols of this world do. But they cannot answer for your sin and your guilt. 
I have never seen somebody proclaim that type of salvation. It's always implied, but never proclaimed. Yes, come invest your time into me, and I will take away your sin. I will take away the guilt that you know you have on your shoulders right now. I can't take that away. In verse 8, Jonah suddenly seems like he has this weird little diversion of his own right here. He says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Remember, he's looking at the source of salvation. He's excited about it. He's happy. It's just happened to him. That's when you're most grateful, is when something's just happened to you. And he's proclaiming it. And then he is, in the next verse, he's like, but God, I look around. I know I've seen so many people that have turned away from your love that you're holding right out to us. And they turn it away for these worthless idols. Idols that have no worth. He sees God's love so clearly in this moment, and it kind of breaks his heart to look at a world full of people that have been chasing idol after idol after idol, thinking this time, this thing will give me what I need. If I can just have enough money, if I can just maybe have enough relationship in my life, maybe I should have that affair I really want. That will satisfy me this time. Maybe if I, I, I really invest myself more into this particular passion or this hobby that I have, I'll suddenly become accomplished and achieved. And God says, no, those, some of those things can be nice in moderation, but they cannot save you. And Jonah realizes that. He realizes that even for the saved, idols don't stop being a threat. They're still a threat to us. They still tempt us to pull off the road, pull away from God. And at that point, God usually is very good to nudge us back onto the road and keep us on that path. But we need to think about that. We need to have that time of evaluation every now and then going, what are my idols? Because we have them. Because they'll never stop. Satan will never stop throwing idols right at us. Some of us will never stop looking for idols. And we need to be very cognizant of what the idols are in our life. Where are the big temptations? Where are the things that really pull me away from God? If I look over the past week of my life, what are the things that I prioritize way higher than I did of the worship and love of Jesus Christ? I'm not saying you have to, you have to do a nonstop 24-7 worship service, but that Jesus should always be the number one in your life. What made him not the number one? What do you need to address? One thing when I was studying this second part of this psalm, I noticed the thing I was expecting to happen didn't really happen. And that's Jonah didn't really say sorry, did he? He doesn't come out and overtly say, God, I really messed up. I'm really sorry. I think it's kind of implied. I think you can infer it from these verses that he does repent, that he can't really be singing about the salvation of God and God's deliverance if he hasn't had a moment of repentance. So maybe that's between the lines and we don't see that there. But what we can see very clearly here in verse 9 is that Jonah isn't repenting reluctantly like a little kid. You get a little kid and they do something bad and you say, you say sorry to that other little kid you just bit. And they go, sorry, right? I don't know what we call that, but that is not repentance. That is, I'm forcing you to say a word and you don't even mean it like in your heart at, at all. Repentance is a complete change of heart that is followed by a change of behavior. Let me say that again. Repentance is a change of heart followed by a change of behavior. It is not just saying sorry to God. It's saying, sorry, God, I need to change what I've just been doing so I don't do it again. And so in Jonah here, I think we do see genuine repentance because he ends this psalm shouting and singing with praise. He's so excited to be back in the right place with God, his relationship with God, which has been completely apart this entire book so far. Now it's finally come back together. And there's nothing so peaceful, nothing so wonderful, nothing so relieving as when you're in the rights with God, after having not been in the rights with God for a long time. I want you to note very carefully, this is, this is your homework here, just to remember one thing from this sermon is that right here in this verse, Jonah is 100% enthusiastic about salvation being applied to him. 
This is going to be very important for the next couple weeks to come. Because he's very excited. Salvation has been applied to him. So excited that he's holding an impromptu worship service inside of a fish. That's how excited he is. But he's not going to be as excited when this same salvation that has been applied to a sinner who didn't deserve it will be applied to other sinners who also don't deserve it. In fact, he's going to completely forget everything that's happened here. What is your response when God reminds you of just how much he has saved you? When you look at the mountain of sins that you're adding to on a daily basis, and God says, you had one foot in the pit, one foot in the grave, and your last breath was coming out, and you had no inherent ability to save yourself, and I came along and I scooped you up out of my mercy and my grace and my love for you. What is your response to that? How do you live out that response on a day-to-day -day basis? When you look at your, your salvation, do you praise God? Do you wake up and say, God, thank you, because this is another day that I've been saved. There was a time in your life you couldn't wake up and say that. There was a time in your life when you woke up and go, if I die today, I will keep on dying forever and ever and ever. I will experience the judgment of a just God against me for eternity. There was a time you could say that. And if you are in Christ right now, you never have to say that ever again. And you can wake up and you can get out of bed. And you can obey God, not because you have to, not because you feel obligated to, but because you love Him so much for what He has done for you that you want to do anything you can to please Him. And because He's given you the Bible full of ways that you can please Him. That's how we live out our faith and live out our excitement for salvation. Thousands of years ago, if there was a diver who went down into the Mediterranean Sea and found the biggest fish there and put his ear against that fish, he would have heard a muffled voice of a guy shouting at the top of his lungs, Salvation comes from the Lord! Salvation comes from the Lord! And he's singing it because he knows it. He knows it down to his soul because his soul is leaping that salvation comes from the Lord. He knows the source. He has found it. We know the source of our salvation. That source has come to us. That source has redeemed us. And that source wants you to remember it from this day on. Let's praise our God because salvation comes from the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this psalm. It's tucked right into the middle of Jonah here. A psalm we might have been tempted to skip over, but Lord, such great words to remind us of the source of our true salvation. Lord, let us ne never take it for granted. Let us never say, thank you, Lord, but kind of feeling that pull back to my old sinful life. It's okay. Uh, don't, don't pay attention. Lord, please pay attention to us. Please pull us back when we stray too far, when we feel those idols pulling us away from true worship in you. Lord, when we feel our own stubbornness get in the way of being humble in your sight. Lord, I just also ask you to fill us up with your courage, the courage to say the words of the gospel to those who have not found the source yet. Those people around us that we know, even if they're putting on a really brave face, Lord, inside, they're still struggling. They're grappling with all that sin. They know they're not right with you. They need to hear the words, Lord. And if, you, if it is your will, use us to say the gospel, to live the gospel in their presence. Help us to be brave to do that. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the words of Jonah. Thank you that it points us all the way to Jesus Christ and beyond. In your name, amen. Acts 20, Paul writes, or Luke writes from Paul said, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. We must remember the words that the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than receive. We like receiving. Enjoy receiving things, but enjoy even more the giving. 
You have this opportunity to give in response to the word. If you would like to give online by dropping it off in the chest on the way out or by sending in a check, you have that opportunity. Please rise as we sing our doxology today. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, among the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Jonah had the opportunity to worship God inside a fish. He was praising God for something that hadn't happened yet, but something that would, that his salvation came from Jesus Christ on the cross. And when Jesus came, he ordered us, commanded us as his followers to partake of communion on a regular basis, to partake of it until he comes again. And so we join the entire church as we proclaim this today. In 1 Corinthians 11, it said, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we come to the table before we partake, let us have a time of prayer. As we make sure our hearts are right with God, that we don't have unconfessed sins on our hearts, and that we come to the table knowing full well what the cup and what the bread signify. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessing upon communion today. Thank you for bringing us into the presence of all the saints. We ask that you would bless these elements to nourish us, to fill us with your spirit, with your purpose, with your love, with knowing you, Lord. Push our sins out to make more room for you. In your name, amen. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Let us eat of the bread together. And after the bread, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink ye all of it. I sometimes get a chill thinking how this has been continuing for over 2,000 years now. It will continue until he comes again, and we will trade communion for a feast, a feast with our bride, bridegroom. Let's stand, let's sing one final hymn together.
two quick things. Uh, I was handed a note saying that there was a set of keys left yesterday at the rummage sale in the cabinet that the volunteers used. Uh, if those are your keys, go see Mary Owens afterwards. And also, if you would like an elder to pray over you this morning, uh, we'll have one down here for prayer afterwards. Receive the benediction from 1 Corinthians. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. May God bless you as you go this week.